trials can be conducted either through randomized control trials or through non-randomized control trials or NRCTs. Having discussed the randomized trials previously, in today's video, we will discuss the non-randomized trials. Unlike randomized trials, these do not randomly assign participants to reference or experimental groups, but instead use other methods to create comparison groups. Now, since randomization was so strict with the rules, in non-randomized control trials, we are not following those rules for practical purposes, but not so much that our results become unclear. This thus explains the definition of NRCTs, which states that these trials are departing from strict randomization for practical purposes but in such a manner that non-randomization does not seriously affect the basis of conclusion. Now, what are the cases which require us to do non-randomized trials? Well, we can list three indications under this. First, when conditions do not lend themselves. For example, you cannot induce cancer in a person just so that you could study the disease. Second, in conditions where preventive measures can be applied only to a large number of people, like in the case of community trials for water fluoridation, randomization cannot be done. Third, in case of diseases whose frequency is extremely low, like cancer of the cervix, it would take too much time and money to conduct randomized trials in all these situations. Now, let's discuss three examples of NRCTs to have a better understanding. First is the example of uncontrolled trials. Here, we won't use a control group, but instead we'll use historical controls, that is, people who have already suffered from the particular disease. So, through these people, we will find out which all treatment measures they used, which one had the better response, we can also find out the side effects of using the other measures, the dosage, etc. Thus, in uncontrolled trials, people who already have had the disease of study will be our control group and through them, we will assess our ongoing research. The second example is that of natural experiments. When selecting people for our control and case group, we cannot tell a group of people that they, for example, need to stop smoking or start smoking for our study, right? Naturally, some people are smokers and some are not. So, this will be helpful for the researcher. Epidemiologists can take advantage of this separation and hence test their hypothesis. Other than smoking, we can also take other examples of migrants, famines, earthquakes, the atomic bombing of Japan, etc. Our last example is the before and after comparison. In this, we compare the incidence of the disease before and after the introduction of a preventive measure. For example, let's say our disease of study is dental caries and as a preventive measure, we introduce fluoride application to the population we are studying. The same population will act as my control group also since they are the people who first had the disease and now they are the same people who should not have caries anymore after the introduction of preventive procedures. In other words, the experiment here will serve as its control. There are certain points that we need to remember while conducting this type of trial. First, the incidence of the disease of study should be recorded before and after the introduction of the preventive or therapeutic measure. Second, it should manipulate only one factor. For example, if alongside fluoridation, you decrease the sugar input of the population also, we will not know if it was the fluoridation that acted as the preventive measure or not. Third, there should be a large reduction in the incidence of disease following the introduction of the preventive measure since there is no separate control group in this case. And lastly, several trials may be needed before the evaluation is considered conclusive. Talking of the advantages, NRCTs are more feasible and cost-effective than RCTs. However, one major limitation of this type of trial is the potential for bias in the assignment of participants to treatment or control groups. Thus, to conclude, non-randomized control trials are a valuable type of study design offering advantages as well as limitations at the same time. By using appropriate designs and methods, these trials can provide important information on the effectiveness of treatments in public health dentistry, helping to improve the health and well-being of populations around the world. Thank you. For more such videos, download our app and watch videos seamlessly and learn through visually engaging mind maps.
We hope we made public health dentistry slightly better for you. Please like, share and subscribe to our channel and see you guys in the next one.